All right. Well, our final presentation is um, is on Utah PPRA, and let's just dive in. I think so. We've got three learning intentions for this uh, session. I guess you could call it. The first is my goal for you guys is to walk away with an understanding of the purpose and scope of Utah PPRA. And actually, I just want to pause here and say, I think it was like two years ago that we also did a session on this. So um, I realize that this is not brand new to some of you, but in our experience, this has been an increasingly, this has been a topic that has been of increasing interest and also is like maybe not fully understood by most folks. So that's the impetus for this session. So learning intention number one is to understand the purpose and scope of Utah PPRA, know how to evaluate real life situations using this law, and finally, know the requirements when seeking parent permission. So let's dive in. We're going to start with understanding the purpose and scope. So first of all, you might be wondering, my guess is that many of you have not heard the term Utah PPRA, and that is because we made it up. So <laughs> in the past, this was called um, the same law we used to call Utah FERPA. And let me give you some more information about that. So um, Utah PPRA is a Utah version of a federal law. The federal law is called the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment, or PPRA. It's pretty old. It's almost as old as FERPA. It passed in 1978. And then later, Utah passed its own version of this law, uh, which is 53E-9-203. This one was passed in 1994. And it, what it does is it kind of tightens up some of the requirements in the federal version. Uh, so it makes the requirements for student or for parent uh, consent stronger and um, adds some clarity to when you have to be careful about these topics and that kind of thing. Well, here's the deal. When they passed, when they made this law in 1994, they called it Utah FERPA to my personal everlasting dismay because it has nothing to do with FERPA. <laughs> um, it's all about, it's like the the Utah version of PPRA. So um, for a long time, we just struggled through and we just called it Utah FERPA and always were explaining like, oh, we call it Utah FERPA, but it's really PPRA. So finally, we just decided enough of that. We're just going to call it Utah PPRA because that's what it is. So um, going forward, you should hear that term for us. And we'll, we won't be using the term Utah FERPA anymore, even though that's what it used to be called. All right, so what is Utah PPRA? Um, it's a privacy law. So FERPA, which we've talked about a lot and most educators are really familiar with, is, um, is a law that protects the data that we already have. We have it in place, we wanna protect it. But PPRA is a little different because it protects what data we collect from students in the first place, which is also really important. So it's kind of an interesting twist on privacy that way. The goal of this law, and I'm just gonna read this, the goal of the law is to protect students from being put in a position where they feel compelled to answer questions on certain protected topics. So let's go through those topics. There are eight of them that are defined in this law. The first is political affiliations or political philosophies, uh, mental or psychological problems, sexual behavior, orientation, or attitudes. This does, and I'll just make a note here that that doesn't expressly say anything about gender identity. And the Utah's Attorney General's office has declined to kind of weigh in on whether or not gender identity falls into this category. But I do have some guidance for you um, on asking questions about gender identity that we'll get into later. Another protected topic is illegal, antisocial, self-incriminating, or demeaning behavior, religious affiliations or beliefs, income, and then the last two are also protected, but I think are far less common. I haven't, I don't see example, I haven't seen examples of this in like a survey, for example. Okay, so let's dive in. So here's, this is where um, I wanted to get into kind of the purpose and scope. One thing that's interesting about this law is that as you guys know, there are lots of concerns about what is being taught in schools. This law can be kind of confusing because if you looked at those eight protected topics, you might think that those are protected topics, but means that those are topics that cannot be discussed in schools. This law, other laws might address that, 
But this law does not. This law is not talking about what can be taught in schools. Instead, it's talking about um, protecting students' privacy. It doesn't dictate what can be taught. The law, another way of saying that is that the law addresses seeking information from students and doesn't address giving information to students. That's why it's a privacy law. All right, so on this slide, you're seeing lots of tiny text, which is you don't have to read, but I've just put it there for reference in case you wanna come back to it later. Um, this is the language in the law. It's only a small part of the law, but this is kind of the meat of it. But what I've done is I've put a bar down here that is my Katie language version of this. So I've taken the law and put it into kind of like normal person language and simplified it. So law's here for you to reference, but let's focus on this Katie language. And it says, in order to give a student a survey that asks about the eight protected topics that we talked about a minute ago, and if those questions are asked regarding the student or their family members, then you must get written parental consent before you give a kid that survey. That's the that's the essence of the law. Um, oh yes, thank you, Melissa. Protection of people rights amendment. So the very best example of this is the Sharp survey. The Sharp survey is full of questions that would require parental consent. Let's look at a couple of them. Um, this question, these are screenshots taken straight from the questions, which by the way, um, everyone has access to, including parents, and that's purposeful. Everyone should be able to see the questions before they decide if they want their students to take the survey or not. So here's an example question. Have you or your brothers or sisters, or have any of your brothers or sisters ever drunk beer, wine, or hard liquor, smoked marijuana, taken a handgun to school? These are all, these all fall into that category of um, that protected topic of illegal, antisocial, and self-incriminating and demeaning behavior. Another example question on the Sharp survey is, which is your religious preference? Um, and this one is asking about the student, what is their religious preference, which is also a protected topic. So either one of these questions would require the entire survey to, to have parent consent. And what I'm, and to be clear, what I mean by parent consent is, it's not just like notifying the parent and then they can, um, and the parent can opt out if they want to. What's really going on here is you need to wait until you, a parent has actively told you, I'm okay with my kid taking this survey. Um, the default is to not give them the survey unless the parent has granted active permission. And, and this is why this practice is in place already in your schools. For those of you who are administering the SHARP survey, you, you know that this is an important practice to make sure that you're not only giving parents notice um, of the survey, but you're making sure that they actively give consent before you administer it. Okay, so that's the SHARP survey for us. Um, here's a couple little nuances. So sometimes people wonder, well, what if the survey is optional? Does it still require, um, what, for the, the SHARP survey, for example, would a, would a survey like the SHARP survey require parent consent if it was optional? And the answer is yes, it doesn't matter if it's optional or not. Um, the parent consent requirement still applies. Another question we get is, well, what if the survey is anonymous? And the answer is, doesn't matter. Parent consent is, parent consent is still required, um, assuming that it touches on one of those eight protected topics in relation to the student or the student's family. Okay, and I hope you guys will just throw questions in the chat as we're going. I know I'm just like zooming along. Um, now that we understand kind of the purpose and scope of PPRA, we're gonna do the next section, which is my, sec my favorite, which is where we're gonna kind of evaluate some real life situations. So I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of different examples of survey questions, and we'll kind of walk through them together and decide if these questions would require parental consent or not according to this law. Okay, so here's, here's our example question up here. Um, we've got the Katie language down here, and then this pink bar is what we're gonna use to evaluate this exact, this um, example question. And then up here, I've got these, the list of protected topics for you to refer to. So let's take a look at this question. Again, we're trying to decide if it um, would require parental consent. The question says, which way do your parents typically lean politically? Conservative, progressive, moderate, other, none of the above. Go ahead and type in the chat if you think that this question addresses any of the protected topics. And if so, which one? You can use the letter if you'd like. Okay, great. A lot of folks are saying A, political, affiliation, 
philosophies and affiliations, you're exactly right. This addresses political philosophies. So we've determined that yes, this does touch on a protected topic. The next question we need to ask is, are we talking about the political topic or political philosophy in general, or are we asking, are we asking the student to reveal information about themselves or their family members? So go ahead and type in the chat. Do you think that this question, yes or no, is prompting the student to reveal question, reveal information about the students or their student family members, yes or no? Yes, you're right. So we're not just saying, hey, what are the political parties in the United States? We're saying, hey, what about your parents? And so this is a clear example of a question that would require written parental consent before you gave a survey that contained this question. All right, um, let's Katie, see. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, um, a question came up uh, in the chat from Angela. How about the recently state mandated climate survey currently open until May 5th? Several of those topics are addressed. It is anonymous and parents were notified, but it was set up as an opt out scenario, scenario rather than an opt in. Yes, Angela, you're spot on. And we're gonna actually talk about that um, in a couple slides. I'll tell you, I guess I should just tell you now. No, I'll tell you later. <laughs> but actually a couple of the questions we're gonna walk through in this practice section are straight from the school climate survey. So hopefully if I don't answer your question by the end of this, make sure you give me a nudge and remind me. Okay, our next practice question says, do any, do you or any of your family members have a mental illness or emotional disorder? First, we need to decide if this is addressing a protected topic. So go ahead and put it in the chat. Is there a protected topic that this addresses? And if so, which one? Okay, great. A lot of you are saying B, and I agree. This is this is a question asking about the mental, mental or psychological problems. Next, we need to ask ourselves the mental psycho or psychological problems of whom? Um, is it about, are we asking about the student or the student's family members? Go ahead and type in the chat, yes or no. Is this about the student or student family members? Yes or no? Great, yes, it absolutely is. In this case, oh, I said the student, but it's actually both. It's you or any of your family members. So again, a clear example of a question. If you were to ask this question on a survey, you would definitely have to get active written parental consent first. Our next practice question. Most of the time, I feel happy at this school. This is an interesting one. So go ahead and type in the chat if this addresses any of the protected topics, and if so, which one? So sometimes when people see this, they if they see a question that's asking about the student's feelings, like their happiness or not, um, they might think that that is addressing mental or psychological problems. The assessment of our attorney general's office has said, that's not what's going on here. This is assessing a student's emotional experience while at school. We're not asking them if they have a kind of mental illness. Um, if we were, that would definitely require uh, parental consent. But in this case, we're just kind of asking them, how, did, how do you feel at school? And so this doesn't fall into one of the protected topics, but we are asking about the student. So this is an, this is an example of a case where it might not be a protected topic, but it is asking about the student or the student's family member. Um, but because it's not both, then you don't need to, you wouldn't need to get written parental consent before issuing a survey that has this question. I should pause here and say though, that just because you don't have to get written parental consent doesn't mean you're not allowed to. And if there's ever any question, I would err on the side of um, providing notice and an opportunity to opt out at, the, at a minimum. We want, we want parents to feel comfortable with what's going on in their schools. And so just kind of giving parents a heads up about, about survey questions that you're asking, school climate survey is a good example of one of those, that um, it's a good idea to give them a heads up and communicate to them that they, the student does not have to take the survey. All right, here's another one. Do you ever engage in any of the following? Sexting, sexual harassment. This is, again, this is a question asked to student, students. Sexting, sexual harassment, student verbal abuse of teachers, substance abuse. Go ahead and type in the chat if you think this touches on a protected topic, and if so, which one?
Oh, that's interesting. Most people are saying C. I would have said D. But yeah, I think it could probably be both. I think it's easy to say that this does touch on the protected topics. I, and again, I, I thought of illegal, antisocial, self-incriminating or demeaning behavior. Who is it asking about? Student and family members or just other people? Is it asking about student or families? Yes or no in the chat? Yes, and so would you have to get parental consent before asking a survey question like this? Absolutely, yes. All right, we'll go through the next ones quickly. Um, this is an interesting question because it's the same topics, so it's still about illegal antisocial self-incriminating or demeaning behavior, but the question asks, do the following types of problems occur often at this school? So we're not seeking, we're not asking the student to reveal information about themselves or their family members. And so this question would not require written parental consent. Again, that doesn't mean you wouldn't want to give parents notice, but that's but it wouldn't, according to this law, you wouldn't have to get active parental consent. Okay, so back to Angela's question about the school climate survey. Does the school climate survey require parental consent? The answer is no, it does not. In other words, if a, if a parent doesn't like give you a permission slip that says, yes, you can give it to my student, then you are permitted to administer the survey. However, it is really important to note that the survey is optional. Also, I would say the more notification you can give to parents, the better, and really communicate to them how important it is to let you to, to let them know that they can opt out and that you're going to honor their opt out request. I also recommend, and this is, by the way, I'm saying I, but this is also the guidance that I know you've received from the USB folks who work with this survey. Um, I also think it's a great idea to give the parents an actual link to the survey questions, which are also available online so that they can see what their kid would be, would be um, reading. Okay, and then why doesn't it require parental consent? It's because in order for it to require parental consent, it has to both touch on one of the protected topics and be asking the question in relation to the student or the student's family members. So some of the questions in the school climate survey for the K through 12 one, I don't, I don't think any in the younger grades um, would fall into the protected topic, but the K through 12 survey does have some that touch on protected topics. But of those ones, they're not asking about it in relation to the student or family member. In other cases, you have questions that are asking about the student or family member, but the questions are not on the protected topics. Okay. All right, and then very quickly, we have one minute left. I just wanna mention that while we talked about this primarily in relation to surveys, which I would argue is probably the main situation where you'll find yourself applying this law, um, there's also, this is also can come up in just like regular curricular activities. So this is an, this is an assignment that a parent um, made us aware of that they had concern about this assignment. And they highlighted, they marked some of these things. They said, this is problematic according to this, to Utah PPRA, that's not what they called it. But, um, and they marked some of these categories. And indeed, this assignment does ask about the wealth of the student, their religion, their political views. Interestingly, the parent identified um, ethnicity as being problematic, which is not identified as a protected topic in this law. But these other three are. So the guidance we would give to you is that even though this isn't an actual survey, um, it is an assignment that's asking information from students about their income, political views, and religion, and it's asking them about the student. It's not just talking about it in broader terms. So I would say, like, while it's not like cut and dry, I would say you should either get parental consent or probably the better option is just to not give this assignment or make a modified version that excludes those questions. All that is to say that this law is not exclusively limited to surveys. Um, like whenever you're asking information from students, you should be cognizant of this law. Okay, you can come back and look at some of these later if you'd like. Um, oh, gender identity, I will mention this really quickly because I promised I would. The Attorney General's office has said, like I said, they have not weighed in on whether or not gender identity falls into the category of sexual behavior orientation or attitudes. So they've kind of like abstained from giving their opinion on that. However, they have come out and said specifically that teachers or schools should not give surveys that ask students their preferred pronouns, um, which I know is a, has been a common practice, um, maybe not common, but I, I've heard of some schools where this has happened, where the 
the teachers are trying to better understand how to best take care of their students. And so they might ask the preferred pronouns of the student in a survey at the beginning of the year. The attorney general's office has said that is not allowed to happen. So this is something that you might need to communicate to the other folks in your LEA to make them aware of this. Um, and, and that actually brings me to the last nuance. Here's information about parent consent that you can come back to and look at later if you'd like. But I wanted to just mention this, which is that um, there isn't anything that prohibits a student from spontaneously volunteering information. So um, if a student wanted to talk to a teacher about one of these protected topics, they could bring it up, but the teacher could not like initiate or like um, prompt further information from the student. And there's also a provision that allows for staff to talk to a student about potentially protected topics particularly probably like mental or, or uh, psychological problems, if they if they feel that the student is at risk of harming themselves or others. And then if that does happen, then they need to immediately contact the parents to let them know that that conversation happened. Oh, Caleb asks, is there a source or published document on that guidance from the Attorney General about asking for pronouns? I don't think there is. We have it in an email. <laughs> so maybe I'll um I'll get from them. I'll talk with them about it and and because I imagine, Caleb, what you're getting at is that it would be helpful to have that documentation when you're discussing with your LEAs about that policy. So yeah, I'll talk to them about it and and um, include it in our next newsletter. 